Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, sorry about the, the snafu with the presentation. Uh, I'm Rishab. I'm a I'm big disclaimer. I'm an academic researcher at, at Berkeley, and uh, I work on help uh, building tools and techniques to help developers better understand the performance behavior of their code. And so, really, really happy to be presenting here, particularly because uh, uh, so some of the recent patches to the kernel were some of the motivating factors behind the work I'm presenting today. So, uh, in an, so next slide, sorry. So in a nutshell, the, the problem that this work is trying to solve is help developers answer frequently asked what if questions about the cache usage of their code, and particularly for unseen and untested workloads that it might face in production. And so simple example of these questions are, how does the cache usage of my network stack scale as a function of the number of connections? And what is my code's cache and hit, hit or miss profile? Uh, next slide. And what I want to emphasize is that we want to do this for developers, not only for their own code, but also for third party code that they're not very intrinsically familiar with. So as a simple motivating example for the rest of the talk, uh, consider a developer Alice who wants to build an in-memory key value store that needs to be fast. And so simple two component key value store with a hash table that Alice knows and understands that's her code and a network stack that she's going to use off the shelf. And because in such systems, throughput is often bottlenecked by the number of LLC misses, uh, Alice needs to answer questions such as what workloads lead to consistent cache misses and how much of the cache does each of the two components use? So for instance, how many cache lines does the hash table touch uh, per key value pair? And how many cache lines does the network stack touch per uh, connection? Uh, next slide. Now, the, the problem is that existing tools to answer these questions are, are insufficient. And so today, when we're trying to answer these questions, we realize that we rely on profilers like Perf and the hardware counters that they come with. And the problem is that these tools are very, very good at providing insights into the concrete specific test cases that we give them, but they don't have any predictive capability. And so you cannot use them to draw conclusions across workloads. And so for example, if I want to understand how many cache lines does my network stack touch per connection, I can give perf, I, I can give, I, I, I profile my workload, I get a bunch of hex numbers, and, and then I have to manually sit and understand uh, how, which part of the memory those hex numbers came from, which I can maybe do for my code, but become sort of an order of magnitude harder for code that I didn't write. And so at the end of the day, developers are often forced to manually reverse engineer their answers to key questions, which is not only painstaking, but also error prone, particularly for third party code. And no, sorry, uh, could you step back? And, and so, and this was, uh, this observation was, was really, uh, the, the, the patch that I, I mentioned on the slide here was really motivating this work because if the fast path of the Linux TCP stack, which is some of probably some of the most heavily exercised code in the world, can have a bloated cache footprint, then it, it's very, very likely that uh, lots of pieces of code all around the world are suffering from such ca bloated cache footprints. So what's, a, what's the key idea? Uh, so we realized that the big challenge is that there is a lack of abstraction for caches. And what do I mean by abstraction here? If you think about it, Alice needs visibility into how the code processes an abstract workload. So an abstract connection, not a specific packet with a specific five tuple in the TCP header. And the problem is that the only way she can obtain this information today is directly from the implementation itself. So she has to either read it, which becomes painstaking after a point, or then profile it, which gives you incomplete answers. And so the question we're really asking is, can there exist some kind of abstract or symbolic representation that can help developers like Alice efficiently reason about cache usage? So uh, in answer to this question, we come up with this abstract representation that we call memory distillates. And I'll start with this uh, 10,000 feet view, and then I'll get into the details. And so at a very high level, this memory distillate is going to, is a representation that is going to retain all the information relevant to how the code accesses memory and is going to discard everything else. And so given the same inputs as the code, what the distillate will do is produce an identical trace of memory accesses, but will not, for instance, produce the right outputs or the right timing behavior because it is not 
time equivalent or functionally equivalent. And so we use this idea of, next slide, sorry. Uh, and so we use this idea of memory distillates to build a tool we call CFAR or cache footprint analyzer. And basically CFAR has this two-step workflow, which allows developers like Alice to answer their questions about cache usage. So the first step called distillation, we use a bunch of program analysis techniques to transform the code into the memory distillate. And the second step, we basically turn this distillate into some sort of database that you can query to answer specific questions about cache usage. And the key idea here is that because the distillate contains all information relevant to how the code accesses memory, you can answer diverse questions about cache usage. And I'll give you an example of this later on the top where I can show you how we not only answer performance questions, but you can also answer security related questions. So in the rest of the talk, I will go into the details of the distillate and CFAR, but if there's one sort of key takeaway I want you to leave with at the end of this talk, it is that, uh, sorry, next slide. It is that this, this abstraction of a memory distillate uh, gives you a simple yet precise foundation for reasoning about cache usage. Okay, so I'll, I'll now jump into the details. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is an overview of CFAR. It, it's very similar to the diagram I just showed you. You have the program source on the left. You have the two phases of distillation and projection and the distillate in the middle. And then you have the answers to different questions that developers have. And so I'm going to dive into the details, starting with the distillate. Uh, you probably have to skip two slides. Yeah. Okay. So to, to give you an example of a distillate, I'm going to use a very simple uh, create system call from a research uh, OS. And this create system call is responsible for creating a new file. And so as you can see, it takes a bunch of arguments and it's going to sort of validate the arguments. And if they're valid, it's going to uh, add a new file. And now this is a very, very simple piece of code, but the key point is, uh, next slide here. Uh, the key point is that it has an input dependent access pattern, just like a sort of a, a more complex piece of code like the Linux curve. So, so as you can see here, based on the process ID and the file descriptor, it's going to access a bunch of kernel state uh, uh, sort of indexing into the arrays based on the inputs. And so what does the distillate for uh, this piece of code look like? Uh, next slide. So the distillate, uh, the distillate is what you see on the right. Uh, don't try to read the whole thing at once. I'll sort of walk you through it. So first and foremost, the distillate, and this is for the data cache of the program is another program. And this program is going to take in the same inputs as the original program. So for instance, here you see the same inputs as the syscall and is going to maintain the same state. So the same process table and the file table. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the, the, the key difference is in what the distillate returns. So instead of computing the correct semantic or functional outputs, what it's going to do is return an ordered sequence of data memory accesses in which each element is a tuple. And the tuple consists of a, a type and an address. Uh, next slide. Uh, the type can be one of three things. It can be read, write, or read, modify, write. And the address is a symbolic expression in terms of the input I and the state S. And next slide. And the reason we chose this symbolic representation is because it allows the distillate to very precisely replicate any the, the memory access sequence of the program, irrespective of the concrete values of the input and state, or for even or factors such as how the address space is randomized. And it turns out you can do this not only for the data cache, but also for the instruction cache. So uh, next slide. So here on this slide, you see the instruction cache distillate for the same program. And once again, it's, going, it's another program that's going to take, into, uh, take us, uh, input the same inputs as the syscall, and it's going to return an ordered sequence of instruction memory accesses, uh, next slide, which are expressed as a function of, as, as offsets uh, with respect to the, the memory the memory address of the first instruction and once again the key idea here is that this symbolic representation allows us to precisely produce the same instruction sequence executed by p irrespective of factors such as where the code is loaded and so that was sort of the distillate at a very high level and the symbolic representation of a program you can think of it as a program transformation such that the new program will only produce an identical sequence of memory accesses 
and nothing else. And so that brings me to a couple of key limitations I want to emphasize is that this distillate is going to discard all timing information related to memory accesses. So you cannot, for instance, reason about memory latencies. And this also in particular affects prefetch operations because you cannot uh, reason about their timeliness. And another thing, another limitation in these is that it does not provide details about speculative memory accesses because these are, for instance, hidden by the hardware precisely extract them without modeling your hardware in some kind of weird way. So that was at a high level, the distillate and this, the symbolic representation. I, I'll now quickly walk you through the process of extracting this distillate or the process of distillation. So distillation in CIFAR is a four step process. And as I told you before, it is uh, backed by a bunch of program analysis techniques. So the first step is the path enumeration step, where we basically analyze the source code to enumerate different parts of the program. And there is no magic here. Uh, it is we basically have three types of analysis that provide different, that occupy different points in this trade-off between completeness, scalability, and human effort. So one sort of analysis backend we have is automated symbolic execution. For those unfamiliar with it, you can think of it as something very similar to what the EBPF verifier does for programs, where it takes in a piece of code, try to automatically explore all parts of the program and uh, just until uh, exhaustively. And this is fully automatic and it's, it's in theory complete, but in practice, it doesn't really scale to complex code. Uh, the other option you can use with CIFAR is sort of a more guided symbolic execution where you manually add constraints on the input and the state. Uh, so that the uh, program analysis only goes down the paths you care about. This actually works quite well, even for code like the Linux kernel, because uh, very often with cache behavior, we care about the fast path code, which is very often the most simple code. So if you constrain symbolic execution to go down the fast path, it can actually fully explore the fast path. And the last sort of backend that we're we're building, and this is still work in progress, is concolic is a concolic execution based packet and what this basically does is it gives you the same information that symbolic execution gives you but only for a set of paths that you can cover in your tests so the idea here would be you take a set of tests and you can run them through and what the, the program analysis will do there is only explore those paths but will explore, give you the symbolic expressions for all memory accesses along that path uh, this is still work in progress and uh, we should be done in, in a few weeks so at the end of this sort of path enumeration step, which is really the big heavy lifting in CIFAR, you end up with a set of path constraints for each path, which is a set of constraints on the input and the state for them to exercise this path, and a set of expressions for the symbolic addresses. And what we also extract is a set of concrete inputs, one for each path. So a concrete input that will exercise that path. And the reason we do this is it'll become clear in step two. Sorry, next slide. Is because in step two, what we do is we use, we replay the program binary. And the reason we do this is because it's just a matter of convenience, actually, because it is much easier for us to analyze the source code. But when looking at the source code, you don't have all the information about memory accesses. So simple examples are you don't see register pressure. But let's say you're analyzing something like LLVMIR, you don't have register pressure. And uh, so you want to get the sort of precise sequence of memory accesses, you need to replay the, and sort of taken stuff like compiler optimizations, you need to replay the program binary. So what we do in this step is we take the concrete input that we got in step one and we replay it with the binary to get an execution trace from the actual binary. And what we use here is pin. So we run the input through pin, uh, we run the input to the program through pin and we extract a very precise uh, uh, detail log of all the hexadecimal addresses it touches. Uh, the next step in step three is basically putting together the results of step one and two. So we basically in this step, we combine the information extracted from the source with the information extracted uh, while replaying the binary to have finally the, the precise information for each path. And then we also use the path constraints extracted for each path to build the entire execution tree. So that is uh, as all the paths that the input can go through in the program. And, and the last step is really just a cosmetic step where we take this execution tree and we translate this into a Python program. And it, it's really not that fancy here because we limit ourselves to binary trees. So we have a very simple, if 
else, if else, else, and so on in in our Python program. And so that was uh, distillation in CIFA. I'll now very quickly walk you through how projection works. So as I've told you before, in the, in the projection step, developers are going to write a bunch of programs that operate on this distillate to get answers to their questions. Uh, next slide. So what exactly is a projector? So projectors in CIFAR are user-defined functions that are going to compute different cache usage properties. So for instance, all of them are going to take as input a Python list, which contains the list of symbolic memory accesses, and are going to answer questions about specific questions about cache usage. So very simple examples you see on the slide here, for example, length of the list is going to give you the number of memory accesses. And the, the second expression where you take each address divided integer divided by 64 and compute a set of unique addresses is going to return the number of unique cache lines touched. So this is sort of the, the trivial examples. The more sort of involved projectors that CIFAR comes with are stuff like how uh, a P scale, which is tells you how cache usage scales as a function of the workload. This is, for instance, one of the first questions that Alice wanted to know. Uh, P hit and miss, which is a cache model to study specifically the hit and miss profile. And finally, as, as I promised you before, you can not only analyze performance properties, but also security properties, because once you have full information about all your memory accesses, you can very quickly identify secret memory accesses that depend on a secret in the data cache distillate and memory accesses that depend on branches in the instruction cache distillate. Uh, next slide. One thing I want to emphasize here is that projectors are very, very easy to write. And, the re and so, so, for example, the first and third projector are both less than 100 lines of Python code, and the cache model is sort of more or less, it, it's much larger, but it's basically taken almost as is from Gem5. And the reason for this is because projectors directly operate on a list of memory accesses, and they really don't care about how the program in question actually produced that list. And so they allow people who are unfamiliar with a piece of code to very quickly and easily understand the cache usage properties of that piece of code without having to understand the piece of code itself. So as, as a simple example, at very high level, let me tell you how the P scale projector works. So what is P scale gonna do? Given a list of ad, uh, ad addresses and a symbol of interest, a symbol is just an input, uh, Compute the, it's gonna compute the number of cache lines touched that will change if the value of the symbol changes. And so it's a very concrete instance, given a, a function in the TCP stack, let's say the transmit function or the receive function, uh, and let's say a particular symbol here, let's say it's, let's say it's a socket, uh, it's going to compute the number of cache lines that will change if the socket changes. So for example, the connection changes, right? And so as, as a simple example here, if you have three memory accesses, one to a constant, one to X plus 16, and one to X plus 72, assuming X here is 64 byte line, it's uh, if X changes, you can have two different, you can access a set of two new cache lines, and so it should return two. So how does it do this? Uh, it, it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, what it's going to do is it's first going to use the Z3 Python API to compute the list of addresses that will change if X changes. Then it's just going to compute, a con it's going to ask Z3 to give you concrete values for which the change will take place, run, uh, run, run these concrete values through the distillate, and then just compute the difference in the concrete cache line stretch. And once again, you can do this and analyze any piece of code because you don't care about how that piece of code actually gave you the Python list. That part has already been taken care of in this list. So, uh, yeah, I, I just want to finish with uh, a couple of limitations about projectors. So one thing is the current prototype only analyzes each path in isolation. So as I told you before, it's going to take as input only one list. Now it's feasible, uh, it, it's very easy. Uh, it should be rather easy for projectors to be able to analyze more than one list at a time but we currently do not support this yet. This was sort of a philosophical decision because the moment you have to analyze more than one list at a time, you have to take into account the, the branches. And so then your projector starts becoming dependent of the program itself. And this nice separation doesn't hold, but uh, it's something that we will add if we see a use case. And the second, uh, and this is a key limitation, is that all of the projectors we have right now assume that the program is not preempted during the execution. So for instance, if I want to compute the hit and miss profile, I will assume that this is the only piece of code that ran for a while, just because there is no way for a projector to analyze uh, what happens if an arbitrary program can run in the middle, because there is no way to compute the set, the state of the cache at the end of that program running. 
Okay, so that was uh, sort of how CIFAR works. Let me sort of quickly give you uh, a few highlights of our evaluation, just show you what you can do with it. So uh, we've analyzed a bunch of programs. We've analyzed the fast path of the transport layer, so just the TCP layer, of the ingress and egress from uh, 6.5 and 6.8. And the reason we chose these two uh, versions is because they are the stable versions before and after the patch I told you about. And we also sort of replicate the analysis on a couple of much simpler TCP stacks, which is a one kernel bypass stack in academia and the LWIP stack, which is a TCP stack for embedded systems. We also did a bunch of other programs, uh, a research kernel, a bunch of open source hash table implementations. And as I talked to you about later, we also did a bunch of open SSL algorithms uh, because with our cryptographic projection. And the questions that we are interested in is, are the distillates extracted accurate and are they useful? So can you do cool things with them? So to answer the question about accuracy, we manually wrote a bunch of test cases that covered approximately half of the paths through each program. And for each test case, we measured the number and the addresses of all the executed instructions and the data memory accesses. And we compared these numbers to the values predicted by the distillate. And in each case, we observed zero error. And to uh, some extent, this should not be surprising because CIFAR, at least when it comes to the distillate, is not modeling anything. It is analyzing the program, replaying the binary, and extracting the information through PIN. So there is there is no modeling here, and so you have a completely precise substrate. And this also tells us that the distillate will hold irrespective of the concrete values of the input and state and how the address space is random. So that was the accuracy. Uh, now I want to show you a few examples of how you can actually use CIFAR. So, uh, the first question we try to answer with CIFAR is the question I, I talked about earlier, uh, which is the question Alice asked and the question that the patch was trying to answer, which is uh, we tried we analyzed the fast path of four TCP stacks, so the four ones I told you about, and we really wanted to know how the working set would scale. So we told CIFAR, and this is a combination of the first two projectors, the scale and the hit and miss, which is predict the number of connections at which each of those four stacks will suffer consistent LLC misses. And by consistent LLC misses, which is each incoming packet will start to crash the cache. And so, next slide, please. So here is, the, here is what CIFAR predicted. So you have the four stacks and you have a number in terms of number of connections. And this is not a comparison between the four stacks. It is just uh, four different numbers that CIFAR came up with. And to validate this prediction, what we did is we actually ran just the transport layer. So we wrote a simple shim. And we measured the latency of just this transport layer. And it turned the slide. And when we measured the latency, we noticed that for each of the four stacks, there was an increase in latency at roughly the point predicted by CIFAR. And when we actually looked at the root cause, this root cause was due to LLC misses. And so the point I'm trying to make is that now with CIFAR, you can analyze the cache usage of a piece of code without having to understand the piece of code. And uh, I mean, among the many things, it will immediately show you that the 6.8 is much more cache efficient. At least the fast path is much more cache efficient. And because it's it's going to fill the cache only at a much larger number of connections. Uh, so we we replicated what the patch did for uh, other memory acts uh, other uh, uh, tcp stacks in particular the kernel bypass stack and so here is a very simple five line projector which is trying to identify how many cache lines within the pcb which is the the process, the, the equivalent of the socket buffer in the kernel uh, the socket in the kernel bypass stack and so basically you take the PCB and you try to compute how many accesses depend only on the PCB and how many cache lines they are away from the base of the PCB. And when we did this, uh, next slide please, we noticed that uh, this is what CIFAR returned. So the top uh, vector is for the, the send path and the, the, the bottom vector is for the receive fast path. We noticed that there was sort of this one errant access to a fifth cache line that was not accessed anywhere. And, and we did this without understanding the stack at all, right? And when we actually went and dug deep, it became very clear because what the stack had done, and this is academic code, I understand, is that a bunch of the timer information was up front. And because this is not used in the fast path, it was you were pushing one access to the fourth, fifth cache line. And so we went and fixed this and we reorganized the struct for cache efficiency. Uh, go to the next slide. And th the results were immediately noticeable, right? So once again, we did the same experiment and we noticed that at this point, uh, for, the, for the fixed kernel bypass stack, 
you start in the the latency starts rising only at a much larger number of connections uh, lastly i want to finish with showing you cfar's flexibility and show you that you can do more than just performance with it so we use cfar to inspect seven algorithms from one ssl 3.0 uh, most of them are the commonly used ones, so AES, SHA, MD5, RSA, and so on and so forth. And here, in addition to uh, reproducing a known cache leakage vulnerability in RSA, we also found a new constant time violation in AES, which had been latent in OpenSL 1.1. And this has been acknowledged by the maintainers in the final stages of being merged. And I just want to very quickly show you what the output will look like to show you how, very, how quickly and, and sort of intuitive it is. So this is based on the instruction cache distillate. And so here is the specific function in OpenSSL, uh, the projection for uh, the number of cache lines, the number of instructions. Uh, and the key thing here is that the padding length of the buffer needs to be a secret because if, if it's not a secret, you are vulnerable to padding oracle attacks. And so very quickly here, uh, next slide, you'll see here on this slide that uh, this is not the case, right? The number of instructions are a very clear function of this padding length. So we went and fixed this and we verified the results with the projector. And you can sort of very intuitively and immediately see that the projection will immediately tell you that the number of instructions is now independent of the input. And so you are sort of constant time. Uh, so uh, to summarize, uh, today I told you about CIFAR. Uh, the key idea behind CIFAR is this abstraction of a memory distillate, which captures in this symbolic representation all the details relevant to how the code accesses memory and discards everything else. And what CIFAR does is this turns this distillate into the substrate that can be projected into answers to diverse questions about cache usage. Uh, so you can find more details about the project in this link. Uh, thank you for your time and happy to take questions. Um, can you talk some more about the findings that you had from the Linux kernel? Because you mentioned earlier on the networking stack, right? So I would be curious, like, yeah. what you found and what you changed, or or if you're planning to. Uh, so uh, to be. So I, I so we didn't find anything new. I'll be honest here. Um, we so this work. We analyzed the Linux kernel after this patch, so I, I, do, I can pass. Uh, so basically, I'll tell you what this patch is. This patch says that the, the key uh, portions of the TCP SOC struct and many other struct, but I'll focus on the TCP SOC, were being accessed or, or were all over the place. And so the fast path was accessing 50% more cache lines than it needed to. And so basically, there was this elaborate measurement and it said, okay, these uh, all of these particular fields are being accessed in the fast path, and so we need to move them up and so on and so forth. And we didn't find anything new. The, 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 the study was fine. Uh, the organization was fine. It's just that you can now do this automatically. When we went and we tried to do this automatically for the new kernel bypass stack, that's where we found the new result. Okay, and and do you have the tool available for developers to try out? Like, let's say if I want to look into uh, other, other areas of the kernel, for example. Uh, 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 absolutely. Uh, so the thing is, uh, we're because of the Concoli execution is 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 still work in progress. Uh, we will release it in a few days. Oh, sorry about the delay. Um, I mean, I can send you the the details about the symbolic execution stuff, but that requires a little too much understanding of the tool. For most users, that's that's been our experience so far. So, I, so we we thought we'll make it public once we do the concoli execution stuff. Sounds good. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think the the main difficulty we had with TCP was actually the um, the fact that we had variables or, or fields used both on receive and transmit path. So um, you said uh, earlier that your tool was only capable of studying one path. So that's uh, that's going to be a bit uh, of a limitation, I think. Uh, so I, I should rephrase. Uh, you can do one path at a time, but you can analyze, sorry, 
you can analyze each path independently. Uh, let me tell you what you can't do. So what you can't do is say, let's say one thread is executing path A at one point in time, one thread is executing path B at one point in time, and they're interleaving in a weird way. That it cannot do currently. But it can say, for instance, someone executing path A, path A is done, then someone's executing path B, path B is done, it can do that. So it just assumes that the different paths are independent. Uh, it cannot analyze all possible interleavings of paths. Thanks. But the so, so just to uh, build on that, sorry, uh, can, uh, can I just finish? Sorry. Uh, if you look at the distillate, right, because the distillate is a program that takes inputs and computes these symbolic accesses as a function of these inputs, distillates are composable in that you can take the distillate of a function, and when it calls a new function, you can just plug in the distillate of the new function, because they're just programs. And so, which is why you can stack up one path after the other. Uh, sorry, I interrupted someone. No, I was going to ask you, basically, if you have two distillates and they get the same inputs, you can in theory say how much they will do false sharing or not, right? Because if you assume that the, the input exactly. is Exactly, right. yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I just looked up the link on your slides and it seems that the yeah. paper and code is actually not on the page. Is there a timeline where you plan to publish it? Uh, so, so uh, so the paper is public. Uh, the papers are is already public. The, the code. Uh, I mean, we we're in discussions with a few people, and uh, we're expecting end of this month. I, I mean, I wanted to have it ready by today. I'm really sorry, uh, but we're expecting by the end of the month for sure. So I mean, uh, apologize for this, but please shoot me an email, and then I'll get back to you at the end of the month with the code. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, paper uh, is. I, I can, I'll add the paper to this to this website. Uh, two minutes after the talk. Again, uh, I wanted to say that um, we couldn't do a complete job of reorganizing uh, TCP fields because of this CCP, uh, which uh, forces us to have um, common fields with TCP and DCP in uh, INET structure instead of, instead of TCP. So when we get rid of DCP, TCP will be much faster. More questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.